It's our season premiere and have we got a jam-packed show for you. We have several brand new segments up our sleeves, but don't worry, we'll still bring you your old favorites. So don't go anywhere because the real deal starts now. Welcome to Season 9 of The Real Deal, Ball State's one and only entertainment news show. I'm Kaylee Russell. And I'm Connor Fack. We're ready to start this season off with a bang, and here to help us is Kelsey Burr with the top stories straight out of Tinseltown in this week's Hollywood headlines. What's the scoop, Kelsey? Insidious 2 was the victor at the box office this weekend, opening with $41 million in ticket sales, which makes the film the number two September opening of all time. It was also one of the best debuts for a supernatural horror movie, coming close to the debut of the summer hit The Conjuring, which opened at $41.9 million. The sequel was released fittingly on Friday the 13th and beat the first Insidious movie with more than three times its opening numbers. Lee Daniels, the butler, has also hit a box office milestone. The movie, starring Oprah Winfrey and Forrest Whitaker, has taken in $100 million so far in North America. Without counting inflation, Daniels is now one of only a few black directors to hit this milestone in the U.S. Whitaker plays a White House butler in the film based on the real-life story of Eugene Allen. The butler is already being considered an awards contender. Julianne Moore is the newest cast member of the Hunger Games franchise. Lionsgate confirmed that Moore will play President Al McCoyne in Mockingjay Parts 1 and 2, the final two films in the saga. President Coyne leads the rebellion against the Capitol in the best-selling book by Suzanne Collins. The Hunger Games Catching Fire comes out November 22nd. Mockingjay Part 1 is set for release November 21st, 2014. And Mockingjay Part 2 will come out November 20th, 2015. Superheroes have been dominating pop culture lately, from The Avengers to Man of Steel, and are now making their way into television. Glee star Grant Gustin has landed the role of The Flash in the CW's backdoor pilot. Gustin will first appear as The Flash, otherwise known as Barry Allen, in three episodes of the show Arrow, which will pave the way for a Flash spin-off series. That's it for Hollywood Headlines. I'm Kelsey Burr. Thanks, Kelsey. There's definitely a lot happening in Hollywood right now, especially on the film festival circuit. That's right, Kaylee. The past couple of weeks have been especially busy for filmmakers attending the Toronto International Film Festival, where some of the most highly anticipated movies of the year make their debut. Here to tell us about some of these films is Ben Kramer with a new segment we like to call Festival Watch. Ben? It's never too early to start looking forward to the movies that are sure to generate Oscar buzz. And what better way to do that than to check out the films that were showcased at this year's Toronto International Film Festival. A total of 366 films from 70 different countries were screened, including over 146 world premieres. Just to make it easy on all of us, let's just look at five of the most highly anticipated films that will be released theatrically very soon. The first film won the People's Choice Award, and since the TIFF has no jury or panel of judges, the audience decides who wins the top prize. The winner was 12 Years a Slave, directed by Steve McQueen. And here's why you should watch it. It boasts an all-star cast including Chiwetel Ejiofor, Michael Fassbender, Benedict Cumberbatch, Paul Dano, Paul Giamatti, and Brad Pitt. Based on the 1853 autobiography of Solomon Northup, a free black man who was kidnapped in Washington, D.C. in 1841 and sold into slavery, this movie has all the elements of Oscar bait. It's a historical drama based on a true story, a story centered on slavery, no less. Hans Zimmer does the score, and Brad Pitt is one of the big-time producers who will make sure this movie gets the attention it deserves. Well, Brad, apparently the people have spoken. Despite the overwhelming buzz it is getting, particularly with the acting of Easy 4 Fassbender, and the directing of McQueen, I give this film my full recommendation. Don't let the hype affect your opinions, but still, go see it. 12 Years a Slave will be released theatrically on October 18th. My next film is also getting a lot of buzz, this one for its groundbreaking use of visual effects in 3D. I'm talking about Alfonso Cuaron's new film, Gravity. Gravity centers on just two characters played by George Clooney and Sandra Bullock. They are both in space when all hell breaks loose involving some space station debris. What commences is a basic survival story. This is Cuaron's first film since Children of Men came out in 2006. 
Known for his long take shots, Quran has been dubbed as a visual master, and gravity could soon become his masterpiece. This film has critics and audiences buzzing over its amazing use of 3D and the visual effects of action in space, and the score and cinematography look top-notch as well. Gravity will, be, gravity will be released on October 4th. Joseph Gordon-Levitt makes his writing and directorial debut in my next movie, Don John. It stars JGL as a man addicted to pornography who later hooks up with a woman, played by Scarlett Johansson, who has her own unrealistic relationship expectations from watching too many rom-coms. And there's your movie. I'm looking forward to this movie mainly for those reasons. I can't wait to see how JGL does directing his own script. Julianne Moore and Tony Danza also star in this movie, and Don John will be released on September 27th. Ron Howard makes his return with the biographical sports drama Rush. It stars Chris Hemsworth and Daniel Bruhl as Formula One rivals who race for the 1976 World Championship. I'm personally excited for this movie because of its sports storyline. Audiences of Toronto have praised both Hemsworth and Bruhl on their on-screen chemistry as intense rivals. Rush will be in theaters September 27th. The last movie I want to recommend is Prisoners, directed by Denis Villeneuve, which took home second runner-up uh, for People's Choice Award. This movie boasts an amazing cast starring Hugh Jackman, Jake Gyllenhaal, Terrence Howard, and Paul Dano. Jackman and Howard's daughters are missing, and it's up to Jake Gyllenhaal's character to find out who abducted the girls. Leave it to Jackman, though, to make everything intense, and that's the real reason I want to watch this movie. Prisoners comes out this Friday. This has been Festival Watch. I'm Ben Kramer. Thanks, Ben. Sounds like we've really got some Oscar contenders on our <laughs> hands. Is it too soon to start filling out my ballot? Just a little bit. Well, it looks like it's time for our first break. When we come back, Aiden Hall returns with the top five, and Ramel Tadai will give us her opinion on the latest trailers. But first, here's this week's box office report. Okay, prove it. Let's get naked, shake money maker, baby, I'm gonna show you how to. Have some respect, that's your mother. Everything you are and everything you have is because of that butler. Was the first day nothing special and i'm feeling good in here what's he saying he's got your baby 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 Welcome back. Harry Potter fans rejoiced this week when it was announced that author J.K. Rowling will be pinning the screenplay for a series of films based on another book from the Potterverse, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. To further speculate about other possible Potter spin-offs, here's Aiden Hall with this week's Top 5. Aiden? Thanks, guys. With the recent announcement of a Harry Potter spin-off series by J.K. Rowling, and everyone's returned to our non-magical universities, I thought it best to come up with the top five Harry Potter characters that deserve their own spin-offs. So sit back, grab a pint of butterbeer, and get ready for one magical list. Number five, Sirius Black. As a prisoner, Harry Potter's godfather, and a magical gorilla fighter, old Sirius Black has quite a story to tell. A story of a seedy underbelly of magic, of curses and hexes, and yet redemption. I'd imagine it'd be a series sort of like Harry Potter's Oz. We've been given PG Potter for far too long, and it's time we saw HBO Presents Harry Potter. Number four, Severus Snape. What better spinoff than one that tells us how we came to the story we got? A story of the parents and teachers of our fine heroes, of the pained Alan Rickman and his unrequainted love of the flame-haired Lily Evans, later to be Lily Potter, or James Potter and his countless Quidditch victories. I imagine it'd be Hogwarts 90210, perhaps even throw in Luke Perry for good measure. And we'd have a treat more sweet than a Bertie Botts bean box. Number three, James and Albus Potter. Another royally brilliant idea would be to follow the pursuits of Harry's sons as they traverse Hogwarts, just as their father and mother did. We could watch as they attended class and face the ultimate evil, 
Puberty, a new show for a new generation of little witches and wizards, an audience old and new, but the same magical story of a world filled with adventure. Number two, Godric Gryffindor. With all the talk of going back to Hogwarts for spinoffs, what about the founding of Hogwarts? A show could perhaps follow the antics of good old Godric, as he and the other three create the School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. The secrets of the school would be revealed, and we might even get a relevant Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw. With these old but new characters, a brand new world would be opened up. And when we look back at the series we've seen before, this could be a very welcomed prequel. And at number one, Albus Dumbledore. Speaking of prequels, what better character to focus on than everybody's favorite wand-loving wizard, Albus Dumbledore? We could see how old Beardy became the head of the fine establishment and his adventures as a young wizard, how he hired the professors he did, and even the secrets of his very, very long life. And there you have it, dear viewers, the top five Harry Potter characters that need spin-offs. I made in Hall wishing you another magical year of cake stands and all-night study sessions. Kaylee and Connor, back to you. Thanks, Aiden. I'd pay good money to see a lot of those films. I don't know. I'd have to see the trailers first. Which brings us to our next segment. Movie trailers can have a significant amount of influence on whether or not you see a film. And sometimes you can judge the quality of the movie based on them. Here to pick apart some of the latest movie trailers is Ramel Tadai in a new segment called Trailer Watch. Ramel? What happens when you take a renowned director in a film set 200 kilometers above the Earth? No, not a sequel to Apollo 13 or Armageddon, but ultimately Alfonso Cuaron's new, newest thriller, Gravity, set for release on October 4th. With Sandra Bullock as the lead role of an astronaut stranded in space, hearing her initial cries for help and trouble with breathing as she's separated from the space voyager gave me the goosebumps in return. Then we cut to a montage of what I'm assuming is her interaction with co-star George Clooney prior to the accident and what she shares about her personal life. As they speak, it looks as though more action is to come with clips of fiery situations and struggle, which I'm really intrigued how Kiran will lay out the entire storyline. All in all, with the push for a strong female lead and a great space photography effects, I'll go ahead and give Gravity a 4.5 out of 5. Now, here's a little equation for you. Scorsese plus DiCaprio equals Scorpio. Get it? Well, Martin and Leo are teamed up again for November 15th's re release of The Wolf of Wall Street, which tells the real-life story of stockbroker jo Jordan Belfort, a self-made millionaire through security fraud who ultimately lands himself in jail. With the power trio of DiCaprio, Matthew McConaughey, and Jonah Hill, the trailer is hyped in full suspense, small comedic factors, thanks to McConaughey and the shenanigans of DiCaprio's Belfort, and not to mention the grand old time period of the early 1990s. As a tale of greed and financial wrongdoing, packed with the over-the-shoulder preppy sweaters and tortoise-shell glasses, I think I'll give The Wolf of Wall Street a 5 out of 5. And now, something that all of us at Rio Deal really appreciate, the second installment of the best-selling trilogy, The Hunger Games Catching Fire. Picking up right where the THG left off, we see Katniss and Peeta embarking on the Victor's Tour, a tour where the Victors are set to visit each district and present themselves before all of Pan Am. As it starts, we can see that both Victors, especially Katniss, have caused much pandemonium throughout Pan Am and sparked what seems like a revolution. Though the capital tries to keep the rebellion under control, the citizens of the lesser districts keep fighting back. With more action, romance, and last but not least, the 75th Hunger Games, aka the Quarter Quell, Katniss, Peeta, and other returning characters like Gail, Hamish, and Effie are in for a rude awakening. Oh, and not to mention the new, newly selected Trained to Kill tributes. Yeesh. But don't worry, you still have plenty of time to read up, or in my case, reread, before its November 22nd release. But don't say I didn't warn you. With its gripping storyline and enticing cinematography and special effects, I'll give Catching Fire a 5 out of 5. I'm Romel Tadai, and this has been Trailer Watch. Thanks, Romel. These movies sound great. I hope the trailers aren't deceiving us. We'll find out soon enough. Looks like it's time for our next break. When we come back, Ryan Miller is here with the latest edition of In the Spotlight, and Isaac Watley tells us about his guilty pleasure. Stick around. Welcome back. After five seasons, the highly acclaimed TV drama Breaking Bad is coming to an end with only two episodes remaining. 
The show shot several of its actors to stardom with their iconic roles, but they were not always a household name. Ryan Miller is here to tell us about the early career of the actor who plays one of the most notorious characters in TV history in this week's edition of In the Spotlight. Ryan. To some, he is a lovable goofball father, but to many, he is known as most famously known as none other than the chemist teacher turned drug lord Heisenberg, a.k.a. Walter White. I hope by now that many of you have caught on that I'm talking about none other than Brian Cranston. Before, before he became a critically acclaimed movie and television star, Cranston grew up in the Los Angeles area, where he graduated from Canoga Park High School and earned an associate degree in police science from Los Angeles Valley College. Cranston began his acting career after college in local and regional theaters in the San Fernando Valley. He had previously performed as a youth, but his parents, who were also in show business, had mixed feelings about their son being involved in the acting profession so he did not continue until years later. After doing a series of commercials for Coffee Mate, Honda Accord, and even Frito-Lay, Cranston landed several small television roles such as Dr. Tim Watley, Jerry Sentist on Seinfeld, Doug Heffernan's neighbor on The King of Queens, and astronaut Buzz Aldrin in From, from the Earth to the Moon. He even starred in Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan as the colonel who insists that Private Ryan be saved. It wasn't until the year 2000 that Cranston landed the lead role as Hal Wicker, Wickle, Wilkerson, the comedic father of five boys on Malcolm in the Middle. Seeing Cranston go from this to Breaking Bad, Walter White, is a big step, but there are similarities between these two characters. Both are loving fathers who ultimately want the best for their family, yet sometimes they have relationship troubles. Cranston has starred in Breaking Bad since its debut in January 2008 and has won three consecutive Emmy Awards for leading actor in drama series. He will continue to play Walter White until the series ends on September 29th. It is this role that he has made an incredible name for himself in the acting world and has created such a cult following for the show. Besides Breaking Bad, Cranston has recently been in several, fe several feature films including the Academy Award winning Argo, Drive, The Lincoln Lawyer, Little Miss Sunshine, and John Carter. He will have a role in the new upcoming Godzilla movie directed by Gareth Edwards, and recently cast in the third installment of Kung Fu Panda franchise. I must also mention that the fact that there are rumors circulating that he has been casted to play Lex Luthor in Zack Snyder's Superman vs. Batman movie. I am sad to report, according to comicbookmovie.com, that Cranston has denied these rumors, but also says that nothing is set in stone. I, for one, have to say that if anybody would nail the part of Lex Luthor, it'd be Cranston. That's it for the In the Spotlight. I'm Ryan Miller. Thanks, Ryan. I have a feeling a lot of people won't know what to do with themselves after Breaking Bad is gone for good. But that's what we're here for. <laughs> right you are. Hopefully this next segment from Isaac Watley will help. What's your guilty pleasure, Isaac? For this week's guilty pleasure, let's go back to 2002 to look at one of the best movies of all time, at least in my opinion. The movie is called Signs, and I have to admit I am obsessed with it. Produced, directed, and written by M. Night Shyamalan, this film tells the story of a family's survival through an alien invasion on Earth. After mysterious crop circles begin to appear in his cornfield, Graham Hess, played by Mel Gibson, attempts to give a rational explanation of the events to his children and to his brother Merrill, played by Joaquin Phoenix. Through a series of flashbacks, we discover the background of the Hess family, including Graham leaving his job as a minister and of the death of his wife. As the family struggles through multiple emotional battles, it appears that all hope of normal life is lost, and when there is a rumor of an alien invasion, the family is forced to stay close by each other's sides to find their way through the confusion. The togetherness and divine intervention that the Hesses experience not only brings the family closer, but also helps them to move forward, returning Graham to his faith. I've seen this film countless times, and from the moment I first saw it, I fell in love with it, perhaps a little too much, in some parts, the dialogue can be a little dry, and let's be honest, the digital effects from over a decade ago were not that impressive. It is by no means a sci-fi blockbuster that could compare with Spielberg's War of the Worlds as effects go, and it's not a film that a whole lot of people will choose for a movie night in 2013. But I just love the storyline. Not to mention the film has an incredible soundtrack scored by James Newton Howard, who, with Hans Zimmer, composed the score for Batman Begins and Batman the Dark Knight. This film was definitely one of the best movies produced by Shyamalan, 
whose more recent works haven't received the highest of ratings, such as Avatar The Last Airbender. Though it may often be forgotten about and labeled as outdated, Signs is a classic in my book, and if you ever find yourself looking for an old movie to watch, I'd recommend it to anyone. Thanks, Isaac. Looks like it's time for our last break. When we come back, Kaylee and I will give you our final word. Stick around. How's it feel to be a team? Damn good, coach. Make that stage ours. The Germans, French, check it out, it's the Koreans. World champs. There's really only one thing left to do. Let's bring that trophy back for America. Sometimes gotta close my eyes just to open my soul. And tonight is the night I got a feeling that I'm about to act a fool. Alex. What in the world did you do? Someone has to make him talk, or they're gonna die. We're not gonna help Keller, but we won't stop him either. Let him do what he needs to. I know you know where they are. Where's my daughter? Glad you stuck around. It's time to wrap things up, but first, here's our final word. With the success of Harry Potter, Twilight, and The Hunger Games, the movie industry has seemed to latch on to a new genre of films, a genre I like to call the young adult science fiction book-to-movie adaptations. The industry has always made movies from books. Some of them were successful, some of them not so much. But lately, it seems like every young adult fiction that involves either dystopia or supernatural beings is being created for the silver screen. In February, a lovely gem called Beautiful Creatures was released, which is about a girl who discovers she's a witch and must choose between love or living in the light. Judging by the awful reviews, the movie was a horrendous adaptation of the novel. I can't imagine why. The mortal instrument City of Bones also recently came to theaters. Supposedly it's about demons, werewolves, vampires, and every other supernatural creature you can think of. Interestingly enough, production for the sequel City of Ashes was delayed because the first movie flopped at the box office. And still yet to be released is, wait for it, Ender's Game, Divergent, Vampire Academy, The Maze Runner, Hunger Games Catching Fire, Artemis Fowl, the list goes on and on and on. Don't get me wrong, I love watching my favorite books play out on the silver screen and comparing the director's vision to my own. But some of the adaptations have really sucked. Anyone remember Aragon, Inkheart, and Lemony Snicket? There's a reason why those movies never had a sequel. I just think that movie producers need to dial down their excitement for adapting every book that has a following. Just because a couple of young adult books to movies were successful doesn't mean every book in that genre needs to be ad adapted. They're not all going to make you billions of dollars. Some books are left to the reader's imagination, which many times are a lot better than their movie counterparts. Indeed. <laughs> for my final word, I want to talk about an upcoming film that will hopefully have every audience on a jolly holiday have the wanting to step in time in the aisles with no spoonful of sugar necessary to have a supercalifragilisticexpialidocious good time. No, they're not re-releasing Mary Poppins in 3D. Not yet, anyway. Rather, I'm super excited for the new Disney film Saving Mr. Banks, set to come out all the way in December. But that's not the point. The point is that Tom Hanks is going to be portraying Walt Disney himself. Now, sure, everybody's seen Disney films, but Walt Disney has never before been a character in a feature film. The story centers around his attempts to produce Mary Poppins, the 1964 classic that garnered 13 Academy Award nominations and five wins, including Best Actress for Julie Andrews in the title role. But as the film shows, the process wasn't as easy as going and flying a kite. The conflict comes from the fact that the woman who authored the book, Mary Poppins, didn't really want her book to become a film especially not a silly Disney film. Emma Thompson plays the wonderfully English Pamela L. Travers, whom Hanks's Disney must cajole, beg with, and pander to just to get approval for the most minor film details. Disney worries that Travers is stifling the entertainment value of the film, while Travers laments that Disney doesn't even understand the moral of the story. 
Now, I'm a Disney history buff. The company, its films, its theme park rides, its other ventures are all topics I spend hours looking at on Wikipedia. I don't want to spoil anything, but I know how the Disney Travers relationship worked out in real life, so it'll be interesting to see the spin that the film puts on it. Now, some critics are already saying that the film is no more than a brand booster, is a feel good film about Walt Disney produced by the Walt Disney Company. But I see it as more than that. In a year when it, the top four grossing films are sequels, threequels, or even the sixth in a series, <coughs> Fast and Furious, <laughs> Saving Mr. Banks looks to be a testament to making films with originality, whimsy, and heart, most importantly of all. For those are the ingredients of a classic. Well, that's it for this week. Be sure to check out our Facebook and Twitter pages for updates on all things entertainment. I'm Kaylee Russell. And I'm Connor Fack. And we'll see you next week.